Okay, we have a good number of people uh, who've joined us. Uh, we have with us today, so I'm Anita Taylor, I'm from, I'm the dean. You're muted, Anita. Thank you. Um, I'm now back online. I need someone to let me uh, reshare the PowerPoint. So I don't quite know what happened technically. It's obviously my internet today that's challenged. So I'm just waiting for Fiona Cassidy in the background to uh, Re-give me the host. Let me just see if I can do that. Sorry, Anita. I'm just I'm just working out. I don't know what's happened. Yeah. Apologies, done everyone. Something weird. Don't worry. We'll get there. We we warned everybody that um, if it went wrong, it would be me. <laughs> There you go. Brilliant. Let's get my cursor back in the right place. And then we'll be okay. Okay, so take two. Welcome to uh, the Trinity Boy Wharf uh, Drawing Prize Drawing Discussion at Drawing Projects UK. I'm really thrilled that everybody's been able to join us this afternoon. And I'm really thrilled that we're able to welcome Roland here and to come and talk to us about their work, their proposals and projects for the Evelyn Williams Drawing Award. The, um, it's really fantastic uh, to welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody from across uh, the country and beyond. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to ask questions via the chat as we go through the discussion, and then we'll be able to convene a question and answer session with Roland and Penny uh, after they've spoken to us about their work. So Roland and Penny have joined us this afternoon. These are two of their drawings, um, and they're going to talk to you about their drawings, uh, which were included in the uh, drawing exhibition, the open drawing exhibition at the point that they submitted and they were awarded the prize. So you have Roland Hicks drawing a uh, double chip shuffle zip on the left, uh, which is a drawing in this year's Trinity Boy Wharf drawing prize. And we have a drawing from Penny McCarthy's DNA series of drawings of which she had two included in the Tr Trinity Boy Wharf drawing prize 2019. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Roland and Penny. It's really great to have you with us. Um, and what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about the origin of the Evelyn Williams Drawing Prize. It's something that was set up in um, 2017 when we were the Jerwood Drawing Prize. And I'm just going to hand host back to Fiona. I'm really sorry about this glitch. Um, but I'm going to talk as I do that. So in terms of... Um, the uh, setting up the award, we had long conversations. It's, a, it's an award that's inspired by, um, we have got a technical glitch, I am really sorry. Please forgive me for this one. Um, 
and we'll be with you in a minute. And we will edit the small amount out of our film. Sorry. I do apologize for the technical glitch. So to go back to, to where we were, um, the Evelyn Williams Drawing Award was established in 2017. And the history of the Drawing Award um, being included in the overall open drawing exhibition, which was formerly known as the Derwood Drawing Prize and became the Trinity Boyle Wharf Drawing Prize in 2018. Uh, was a, a proposal that came from the Evelyn Williams Trust, which came at the same time as um, a discussion that I'd had actually with Paul Hobson from uh, Modern Art Oxford the previous year, um, around the sense that there were different kinds of awards that could be presented and thinking about how one might develop um, other awards and opportunities for artists, because in the end, the Open Drawing Exhibition is established to provide the opportunity to have work seen, seen by eminent selectors, to be selected potentially for an exhibition which then tours uh, within the UK. And obviously alongside that, there are awards which further reward talent and excellence in contemporary drawing. So in terms of the exhibition, we had a whole, I've always been interested to think about how we build other uh, relationships for drawing out of the exhibition and the opportunity that that has and drawing projects UK itself is exactly one of those projects uh, which was founded to run the drawing prize while I was in Australia. So the opportunity to work with the Evelyn Williams Trust uh, who have been enormous champions of drawing ever since they were established. It's a trust set up in the name of Evelyn Williams who was a, an artist who drew um, and the uh, trust was set up to support uh, also women artists, but also drawing uh, particularly. And I'd worked with the trust before uh, to have a fellowship in drawing uh, and also in terms of uh, an award. Uh, so it's the, the opportunity was a fantastic one and it's offered on a biennial basis. Um, so there is a £10,000 bursary, which is paid to the recipient through the period uh, of the award as they prepare um, or develop a proposal for the show. Everybody who is awarded it is already pre-selected. They're selected for the exhibition and they have a track record. And then we invite people to submit a proposal about what they would do if they had the award and it was to support them towards developing an exhibition with what was called the Jerwood Gallery in Hastings now, Hastings Contemporary. So in 2017, Barbara Walker was the recipient. Uh, we work with the trustees. Um, so the exhibition is selected by the annual, annually appointed selectors. And then the uh, panel, which includes the director of the gallery and one of the trustees and myself work to um, choose uh, from the proposals and we work through. So you've just been looking at Barbara's drawing, which was selected for Joe Drawing Prize 2017. Uh, her proposal was to work with the National Gallery in London, to work with a major collection, to examine uh, the, or to identify black subjects within Western European painting within the collections. Um, and we were very fortunate to work with the National Gallery to, and the Western, um, the art fund with Western uh, Loan Fund, which was established that year to borrow two paintings from the National Gallery for the Jerwood space for the final show. So the whole show was about working with a collection as a research project. And Barbara produced a fabulous body of work, uh, which was presented uh, at the Jerwood Gallery uh, and so something like 18 months, perhaps a little bit less after she'd been selected for the drawing prize. So it's, that's really to set a context. The first one uh, of the awards was incredibly successful as are the next two or will be as they go forward. And I just thought it would be very nice to show us a lovely slide of two of the trustees, David Alston and Nicholas Usherwood who were involved in selecting um, the recipients of the award. So without further ado, with that very small and rather interrupted introduction, 
Um, I'm going to invite Roland, Roland Hicks, to talk to us a little bit about his proposed project, about his work, what uh, the drawing that is included in the exhibition and how uh, the proposal is anticipated to develop. Roland, of course, was awarded the Evelyn Williams Award at the 29th of September. So this is a very um, early stages in terms of uh, the proposal. But Roland, it would be really lovely to hand over to you uh, and to welcome you to talk about the work. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a funny one. I've got a slightly strange personal history with drawing because for about 15 years of my career as an artist, I didn't really do any. Um, I just used photographs and then painted them. Um, but several years ago, there was a major shift in my practice. And, and these days, I do quite a lot of drawing um, mixed in with painting, sculpture, collage, quite often all within the same piece of work. Um, and I don't really have a sort of hierarchical difference between those practices. Uh, I think they're all equally uh, important. Um, and these days I make uh, pieces of work that, as the images uh, show, they're, they're trompe l'oeil recreations of, uh, well, they're sort of imaginary uh, constructions uh, that look like bits of chipboard, uh, found materials that have maybe been slightly hastily uh, stapled together um, in a abstract arrangement or one that maybe references uh, the history of abstract painting. Um, and but they're, they're usually quite small objects. Um, and for a long time, I've been wondering about ways of doing this on a much bigger scale, but not really um, found an opportunity to do that. Um, and the, when I had to propose something for the uh, Evelyn Williams Drawing Award, um, I suddenly thought of this uh, idea I had nagging away at the back uh, for a little while, uh, working directly on the wall and turning a whole wall into a kind of patchwork of uh, these kinds of materials. But, um, and I, I, I just thought, this would be the perfect opportunity to do this. And um, to do it at Hastings as well, which is a space I, I visited uh, during the pandemic to see the uh, Victor Passmore exhibition that they had there um, last year, uh, the year before now, isn't it? Um, which is a beautiful show in a you know beautiful space. And the thought of doing something there is incredibly exciting. Um, and so, yeah, so what I'd like to do there is to draw a network of false joins and gaps uh, onto one of the gallery walls uh, to suggest separate panels and sections um, uh, which would appear to be held in place by trump loy uh, screws or staples um, as if cobbled together by someone with fairly rudimentary carpentry skills um, and I do this probably with a combination of colour pencils and collage perhaps and a little bit of painting as well um, and usually the types of materials I'm using are, are like here sort of OSB uh, oriented strand board, chipboard, uh, maybe melamine, sh bits of shelving, things like this. Um, but I'm sort of thinking the scale of it uh, in a, a gallery wall, uh, I'd have to scale things up. So I'm thinking possibly I might use elements the size of uh, a door or something, or um, uh, the side of a kitchen cupboard panel or something like that. And you just see the little holes and scuff marks and, and things. Um, but I'm also thinking perhaps of using materials specific to uh, Hastings. So there's those amazing uh, fishermen's net drying huts next to uh, Hastings Green Temporary. So I was thinking maybe some nice bits of black wood 
could appear in there as well in the design somewhere uh, or, or anything else that's um, uh, might look like it's just been salvaged off the beach or something. Um, but I've, I, I like the idea of it possibly being unclear if there's even an artwork in the room. So it might just look like a, a really makeshift and slightly shabby wall that's uh, in danger of collapse. Um, and I like the idea of that also possibly, you know, it could be read uh, literally and, and metaphorically. Um, I think there's quite a lot of potential in that, especially given the, uh, the location uh, of the gallery. Um, uh, but I've got, I've got a working title for the project, which, uh, I mean, obviously I haven't done any work for this yet because um, it's probably going to be quite a long way off uh, before the show actually happens and I'll have to do an awful lot of work on site. Um, but the title of the show in my head is The Fourth Wall, um, which is refers to the theatrical tradition of, of breaking the fourth wall between stage and audience. Um, and obviously the nature of illusion in my work is, is very, very relevant to that. Um, and um, I'm also thinking that um, because I'll have to do a great deal of the work on site, that perhaps that could become part of the exhibition and that uh, people will see it emerge bit by bit. Um, and so people can see me sort of both building and breaking the fourth wall um, while the, the show is going on. Um, so, so that's that's pretty much uh, the proposal for the show. Um, and obviously, um, and I think I probably can prepare some elements in advance, um, maybe large areas that can be collaged on. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's going to be. I, I genuinely don't know how long it's going to take. Um, so it could it could have all go horribly wrong. Um, but I think uh, I, I think it's going to be really uh, a really exciting process, and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I just hope I don't have to wait years and years for it to happen with the more lockdowns and stuff. But um, I, what I'm unsure at the moment is whether, because um, usually the work has a very strong reference to um, the history of abstraction, as well as clearly being about a certain amount of, you know, realism, hyper-realism. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the design that I will come up with uh, will be as much to do with an abstract painting, if it will be more about more purely illusional, perhaps. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm uncertain of that yet. I think I've, I've only know once I've been able to choose a wall uh, to work on and, and get the dimensions and um, uh, the rest of it. But um, yeah, so I, mean, I sort of think this last image here that's up on the screen at the moment is probably the most relevant in terms of you know dividing up a rectangle and uh, filling it with sections um, but obviously they'll be much bigger and there'll probably be a lot more of them as well um, in the final design um, yeah oh I forgot to mention actually the, the title of fourth wall as well as the theatrical reference is obviously a very uh, sort of rather stupid and literal description of what will be the fourth wall in a room um, and, and perhaps that was obvious or not, but anyway, I thought I'd better mention that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, that sort of describes um, the project. I mean, I suppose I should also say that. I, uh, no, I think I already said that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that probably. I don't think I've talked for 15 minutes at all, have I? I've probably rattled through it rather quickly, but um, uh, I'm not sure what else I was going to say. Um, that might be about it. Uh, 
yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about it at the moment, if that's okay. Uh, but very, very happy to answer um, any questions uh, later on. There, finally. Sorry, I've got a real problem today with my technology. I'm really sorry. Um, Roland, that was really fantastic introduction to your work um, and really fantastic sense of a proposal and a proposal that's really quite clear, but obviously is going to transform and uh, transition um, as you work your way through the project. So I think a really wonderful introduction to what it's like to have made the proposal. This is the body of work on which it's based. You have a fabulous track record of realizing uh, exhibitions and projects. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how the project develops and goes from there. So I'm going to say a huge thank you. I'm going to introduce Penny um, to speak about her project, which is at a more advanced stage, having had a couple of years working on that um, and I'm hoping that my technology decides to behave at this point so I do apologize if anything goes astray again. So Penny, uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you and really looking forward to hearing how the project um, for you has been developing in terms of both the way you set out to develop the project from the work that you submitted and the proposal you made for Hastings. So over to you, thank you. Thank you, and Anita. Yeah, could I have my first drawing? And I'll just ask you every time I need you to change slides. So, hi everybody. Um, so I'm talking about um, a proposal and work I made in a distant pre-pandemic time. Um, it just seems surprisingly odd for me today at this point. So I made. Um, I should say, because um, it's quite, it's, it's just interesting that um, I have very, very often been in the Trinity Boy um, drawing prize. And at, at one point in my life, I thought, God, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could um, get myself to be in that show every year for as long as it could run for. Um, but I work really, really slowly and sometimes I haven't had a new piece of work every year. So it was great to be in the show and obviously fantastic to win this award. And this is the drawing along with the one that I'm going to show you in a second that won the award. Um, it's been a really lucky piece of work for me. Um, it's um, pencil on paper. And the paper itself is about a metre long, so that gives you a sense of its proportions. I always work size for size to the original. What this is a drawing of, or rather I should say what it appears to be, um, is some open pages from uh, Nature magazine, um, where the first um, theories, including Watson and Crick's theory of DNA, and Ros Franklin's and Maurice Wilkins' theories of DNA appeared in 1957. Um, the um, strange thing about the drawing is maybe that I, in fact, moved stuff around from the uh, edition of the magazine um, because I wanted in a really literal sort of way to give more prominence to Rosalind Franklin's um, x-ray which is in the top right hand corner which actually shows the structure of dna and if you know the story you'll know that jim watson walked into a room where francis uh, where rosalind franklin was giving a lecture where she showed her x-ray but she did not know what discovery she'd made so the um, discovery of dna was um, an instance of visual thinking um, and visual recognition of a structure. Um, and um, also, 
with the since I've just given a feminist reading of history by talking about that, um, I should also tell you that the very well known diagram of the DNA helix, which is in the bottom left, was actually drawn by Odile Crick, uh, Francis Crick's wife. Um, women were more in this story than one might think. Um, Anita, if you could just move to the next slide. Um, this is the infamous X-ray or uh, my drawing, again, pencil on paper, a little bit of colored pencil. Um, uh, photo 51, which is Ross Franklin's um, X-ray of the spiral. Okay, so jumping forward from that, um, I made a proposal, um, and if we could go to the next slide, this is the title of this body of work, Cloud Falls in Love with Mortal. I'll come back to that, it's okay. So if you jump to the next slide, um, my proposal was based around this newspaper image of an atmospheric event that happened in Hastings in 2016. Um, I was very interested in this Fata Morgana, which um, is a translation of um, Morgan the Fay, the fairy, um, the fate, fate of Morgana, fairy Morgana. Um, it's a particular kind of uh, mirage that happened in the sky above Hastings. And in a Fata Morgana mirage, um, you get a, a sort of flip, um, a mirror image of the city or the landscape below. And if you see in this photograph, you see what appears to be a portal in the sky opening up to a city in the sky, um, conceivably Hastings. Um, I was so excited when I read this article, um, because it seemed to tap into lots of things that I really love, um, like Philip Pullman's uh, stories about um, dark matter and uh, about parallel dimensions. So there was already something that really excited me about something as prosaic as the local newspaper article and something as extraordinary and mysterious and potent as this myth of um, a portal that opens up due to scientific or atmospheric conditions. So if we go to the next slide. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, and, yeah, that's great. And this is another um, drawing that somebody in Hastings made of, that exp of the experience of looking at that mirage. So if we go to the next slide, Um, so, um, this is the first drawing I made. Um, it's interesting to have moved from looking at scientific information to looking at ways of telling stories about the world that are more akin to myths um, and much more subjective, one might, might, one might think. So this is... Um, uh, my drawing of the sea above Hastings and the portal opening up. Um, and this is actually um, a double image. So the same image is also on the back as on the front. Um, one of the extraordinary things about Hastings is that the, it, the, the skies are just extraordinary. They're absolutely amazing. Um, and you get these incredible colors in the sky and um, Obviously, um, even with pencil drawings, my pencil drawings, um, viewing them digitally isn't ideal. Um, so I need to tell you that there's a bit of color in this drawing. Um, yeah, so this isn't a particularly large scale drawing, um, but it's quite densely worked. If we could go to the next one, please. I, start, I was thinking a lot about how you represent something so ephemeral. Um, and so looking at some of these uh, historical images and the next one, please. 
um, one of my favorite paintings of all time, of all time is Correggio, um, where um, a woman uh, has sex with a cloud, is raped in fact by a cloud. Um, something, there's something that really excites me about um, how one might conjure up through drawing or painting something imagined but in a using a style of drawing that is or painting that is really sort of realistic. Um, so with the Correggio, I love the fact that he's tried to work out how this might actually work, this experience. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, And thinking about this made me think of a Star Trek episode that um, possibly I'd seen as a child or seen as a rerun. Um, it was a fantastic episode um, where um, one of the spacemen um, meets an entity which is actually a cloud, but it's, the cloud is sentient and it, falls in love with the spaceman. Um, very um, interesting, very close to lots of myths. So I've been looking at lots of myths. There are um, a surprising amount of cloud myths. Um, at one, in one mythical story by Euripides, um, Helen of Troy is described as actually a woman's face in the cloud, her body as cloud. Um, it's exciting because it sort of seems to tap into uh, lots of things um, that are very current about the Anthropocene and also about gender. Um, so if we go to the next one. Um, so uh, this is my drawing. Again, this one is about a metre long pencil on paper. And then it, if we go to the next. Um, so, because I've been working on this project for a couple of years, par partly due to the pandemic, um, it's evolved and uh, I've really started um, from, first of all, thinking about um, this parallel dimension of the sky. I've been thinking a lot about um, fiction and our relationship with uh, the sky and the clouds and the stars. And I've been reading um, a book I've read many, many times, Antoine de Santo Spiri, uh, Wind, Sun and Stars. Um, and I was drawing this, I started drawing this a few weeks before the pandemic started. And it was quite strange because I've been drawing these women in these um, masks. I don't really know um, quite what's happening in this picture because um, it, it kept changing as I was working on it. Um, I, don't, I don't quite know what these women are up to, but I feel like they're trying to fix something. Uh, can we go to the next, please? Um, and this is Alganiki. Alganiki uh, was the f in uh, fifth century BC, the first woman astronomer. And um, Alganiki was a sort of sorceress and she could predict the eclipse. And she really could, you know, there are many instances of her predicting the eclipse. Um, we go to the next. So I've not only really been thinking about stuff that's um, closer to fiction or closer to myth. I've been thinking about how we imagine our world and how we talk about our world, both through the lens of science and through the, through the lens of fiction. Um, and this is a, this drawing is called My Battery is Running Low and It's Getting Dark. And the, 
little Mars um, rover called Opportunity or Oppy to those of us that were following it um, was um, sent her this an image, which is, this is a drawing of her, and she was always referred to as her, um, of uh, the galaxy seen from Mars. Um, and her last message um, is understood to be, my battery is running low and it's getting dark. And there, I mean, some of you will know this, there was a most extraordinary emotional outpouring on Twitter when this little um, Mars rover, we think of it as, as her death. And I don't know, all the time I was making the drawing, I was just thinking about what it would be like to have a perspective on Earth from another galaxy, or what it would be like to see the world uh, through the eyes of a machine and wondering why um, this concept, I, I found this concept so emotive. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Okay, um, and in thinking about these things, thinking about the natural world, um, I um, was also, I live in Sheffield and there's an extraordinary collection of Ruskin's work. Um, and if you spend time thinking about Ruskin, you probably quite quickly get tired of him and his views. Nevertheless, this beautiful book, which I found in a charity shop, um, is quite extraordinary. And it's Ruskin's collection of drawings of wayside flowers. It's called Prosopina. Um, and it, um, it and I, wanted to sort of talk about um, ecology in some way um, by evoking Proserpina, who is the goddess that gets taken to the underworld and cut um, through a long series of events, um, returns in spring. Um, and I also have to say that sometimes when I talk about stuff, I talk about the stories in my head but a lot of the time, of course, as anyone that draws will know, I'm thinking about drawing and how to make the drawing. And I wanted to draw marbled paper because I thought it would be difficult. And with most of these drawings, and I've maybe, um, I don't work very fast. I work really, really slowly. But maybe got about 15 of them that might go in the show. But sometimes, often actually, I start drawing something because I think I might not be able to do it. So there's a there's a real sort of technical challenge um, and a pleasure in um, immersing myself in that. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and another myth, which um, I'm working on on the drawing beh behind me as well. Um, Niobe, the myth of Niobe. Um, these are some photographs um, from a collection of statues in the Borghese Garden in Rome. And the myth of Niobe is um, she bragged too much. Um, Zeus, the god, struck her da struck down um, her wonderful 14 children, the seven girls and seven boys, and Niobe, there's a, this is a collection of statues in the Borghese Gardens of um, 17 statues. And in one of them, we see Niobe weeping over her dying children, of which this is one. Um, and she begs Zeus to turn her to stone. And she is literally turned to a statue that we see. So it was, I, I, I was interested in that. And um, I'm going to come to the final slide, I think. Um, so all night I hear the water sobbing. Um, and throughout this, making this show, I'm showing you a real tiny snapshot of the show. I've been thinking about the natural world and particularly the sea and the sky. And I, wanted to think about the ocean 
as a sentient being, as a living being. So that could be talked about as it's talked about in myths, um, as Oceanus, who is the god that's the ocean god in the form of an ocean wrapped around the world, or it might be Gaia. But for me, on a really personal level, I just wanted to spend some time in the process of work, immersed in thinking about the sea and the sky, um, which is all I can ever think about when I visit Hastings. Okay, I, I think that's... Um, that's really fantastic, Penny. I'm not quite sure how we've managed a red line on the screen, but we have. No, I wondered... I thought, uh, <laughs> We're obviously having one of those days of quirks, but what a brilliant um, introduction to the work and the inspiration that you had for the proposal. And actually, there's something very lovely about seeing how that's rolled out into this whole exploration uh, of things which are very much about ephemeral temporal experiences and reaching into another world. Um, and the otherworldliness, I think, is really apparent through the work. Um, for those of you, I mean, I think with both of you, the quality of the works themselves, the very spe specific nature um, of the materiality and the thinking through the material thinking um, is really extraordinary. Penny's drawings are extraordinary surfaces, um, and we have had the pleasure of having them in the exhibition several times. So, uh, you know, that is... Uh, it's one of the pleasures, uh, as always, with the Drawing Show, both the selection, the working with artists to develop these other projects is about really understanding the nature of that material thinking um, and the projects that you realise. Now, I'm sure there are going to be masses of questions for you um, and be really lovely to, to think about if actually is there a what I'm fascinated by is the specificity of Hastings. That isn't actually necessarily, and for anyone who's part of it, that hasn't been a specific nature of, um, you know, the brief that we're requesting from people in terms of their proposal. And as you can see, Barbara's project didn't um, have that specificity, but actually both of you have come to Hastings um, from your respective locations with a really very specific interest uh, in the gallery. And I wonder if that's something that you reflect on, um, because I know in lockdown it's been harder for you, Penny, to spend time there, which is, was partly what you anticipated in your relationship with Hastings was about gathering momentum and experience from Hastings, whereas Roland Jules is very much about knowing the space and... Uh, responding to it and recognising that the intensity of your project is as it reaches its crescendo, if you like, towards an actual exhibition. Um, they're very different ways of working. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything in that that I'm, either of you reflect on uh, in terms of questions for each other, especially when you're starting out. Penny's had longer to work on this because of the impact of lockdown um, in terms of because it has been a very odd period and I loved your prophetic drawing um, in there as well so uh, over to you two and I'll then ask you some questions from the chat and I'm just going to encourage everyone to pop some questions in the chat because it's a really fascinating um, diff very different sets of work very different approaches um, I'm, I'm any thoughts? I'm quite curious about um... I think I read something about Penny's uh, um, research into Hastings that um, I, I think I think you said uh, somewhere that there was there was a history of fakery in Hastings that you were very interested in. I, I'm very curious what that is because obviously that's quite um, uh, relevant to my own uh, things. So. Um, can you enlighten me on that, or, or have I misremembered? No, uh, no, you haven't. Um, have you been to Hastings yet, Roland? I, I have. I've. Uh, I mean, I've. I've. Um, I, I, I haven't been down since I've won the award. Um, but I went down. Uh, at, at 
after the first lockdown, um, I got to see the Victor Passmore exhibition at Hastings Contemporary. And um, I, it's one of the reasons I was so excited to propose something for the show, because I, I, I had such a wonderful gallery experience um, down there and just really enjoyed being in Hastings as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I was... I was um, well, I mean, as, um, as, you, as you said, I mean, the gallery is fabulous, really absolutely extraordinary, lovely architecturally. Um, and I, I had not, I had been to Hastings many years ago, but I had not really remembered it properly. And a lot of the things I proposed, um, I, I imagined myself in conversation with people about seeing this uh, mirage in the sky. And I imagined myself working um, there's an, a very well-known um, postcard producer. So I always thought something about print and postcards would be in part of my show. Um, one, so it has, a, it has a history of magic and it ha has a history of fates and the two things are related. So um, uh, most of you possibly will have heard of Alistair Crowley, um, the um, sorcerer, magician, whatever you want to call him, who's based in Hastings. And uh, Crowley made a lot of rituals in Hastings and a lot of magic props. So, and alongside Crowley's work, there were a lot of sort of fake um, spells, experiments, and there were there were a lot there were a lot of um, sort of postcard fakes of things um, where they they'd sort of slightly altered um, the city. And um, I found on eBay um, quite a lot of postcards where um, fake barriers and uh, something that I think is really related to your project, um, sort of sets were built um, during the war to um, disguise parts of Hastings and to disguise the beach. So yeah. If, mm. I can, if I can find the postcard that I found on Hastings, um, I will send you it. That's um, brilliant. Uh, I don't promise because I'm not sure, I'm not very ever very good at finding things. I suppose, <laughs> but there's a really um, I got this post. I, well, I screenshotted this postcard from uh, eBay where um, there was a fake bomb on the beach at Hastings. So um, you know, but but. Yes, I, I just, um, it's a funny old place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's also something, I mean, I think the fakery in that, and also it's an incredibly beautiful place. I mean, the sea and the horizon and obviously the whole setting for the gallery. And Roland, you're obviously also thinking about some of the site specific things like the fishermen's, the fishing net huts, which are also quite extraordinary. But there's something that you said, Penny, which was about the challenge of the difficulty of making and the challenge that attracts you to drawing difficult things. Um, and both of you have an immaculate or a capacity to render immaculate surfaces. I mean, the, the, your drawing in the show, Roland, is absolutely spellbinding and the trompe l'oeil is extraordinary. Um, and there's something in that. I mean, is that something that is actually in common in terms of the way that you... Um, work is that something for you, Roland, as well? Um, so, sorry, what? what well, the, tra um, the challenge of difficult. I mean, the the the, you, the drawings are hyper realist, if you like. Yeah. Or, um, you know, there is a real challenge. There's got to be a real challenge to make something so convincing uh, in the way yeah, that you do. I so, I, I'm just, I was just really interested, Penny, that you pitched it as that, and actually, Roland, you have also that um that level of challenge i think uh, I, yeah I, I mean oh sorry go ahead <laughs> I, I, i've been i look at roland's work and i'm um i absolutely love trump and it's kind of not really fashionable to, or it hasn't been fashionable to to say something like that but i i look at it and i just try and work out what the trick is hmm. yeah how, how did you do that um, so it's there's a thing there about making, isn't there? About uh, I, I'm looking at that one now and thinking, how do you 
what went into that? Where did you start? How do you, uh, you know, what's this, you know, because it's, it's like a magic trick, isn't it? Being able to draw in a way that's so hyper real. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I suppose I, I've got a slightly um, uh, tricky relationship with, with Trump Lloyd in that um, I, th I think there's a danger with it that once you get the trick, there's nothing else left. And I think that's why I've always tried to bring in other elements that confuse mm. it even more and or, or that just keep it, um, uh, keep, you know, you're not sure if it's, I mean, if people don't under, get that it's Trump Loy, there's something else there for them anyway. It's, um, I'm, I'm quite happy if people just enjoy it. Um, I mean, less so with the drawing, because you can, I mean, when you see it in reality, it's, it's obviously a flat piece of card mm. rather than a, three-dimensional object but with with the three-dimensional objects that I make it's it's less clear that it's not what it appears to be um and I always I always always feel like I've succeeded if someone just really enjoys the work thinking it is just bits of chipboard because I think um obviously that's an equally valid way of making work but um um but I want it to be both those things at the same time and um, the one not to be more important than the other. Um, but um, yeah, but I think the Hastings thing does represent a challenge uh, just to scale it up because I've never attempted this on a large scale. Mm. So it was, um, uh, but that's exciting. <laughs> it's an exciting challenge, I think. And I think it'll be really mm. interesting to see how that develops. I think there's a, there's a question in the chat, which is for you, Roland, Okay. Um, which is about the scale. Um, it's asking actually what scale you currently work with and will you begin to work on a bigger scale in preparation or just dive in on the fourth wall? Um, I think I'll probably do some test pieces that would potentially be elements of the... Just so, I mean, I think I can work on a large piece of paper which could potentially be stuck onto a wall and would just be a, a panel within the design. Um, and I think practically I'm gonna to have to pre-prepare some elements of the design. Otherwise, yeah, there's a risk that I might not finish it in, <laughs> during the duration of the show. Um, but I, and I've also made some decisions whereby the size of individual panels are like to be so much bigger that it will, mm -hmm there won't be much detail work on some of those sections. There'll just be like a large white door or something with just a few little, um, a few little details within it. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, until uh, I'm a bit nearer to doing it, I don't think I can um, make a lot of those decisions quite yet, but, yeah. um, but generally speaking, I don't enjoy making large scale work. And I, I don't particularly imagine starting to make huge objects in my studio. Um, I like the idea that it will be on a wall and then it won't stay there, you know, because at some point it will be painted over or wiped away or, you know, whatever. And that's still quite impermanent, so that. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating, that kind of level of labour and intensity, and it's just removed uh, or covered over so I think all I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it develops and what that challenge is and obviously to plan um, actually where in the space it's going to be because you're going to need to know that quite soon. Yeah I mean, um, I'd quite like it to be in a wall that faces the sea because I'd quite like the idea of it as a rather ineffective sea defence hmm. wall um, and all that might suggest you know with the yeah, and that's obviously something quite specific to Hastings as well. Um, um, yeah, but I mean, obviously that can be quite ambiguous. Uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you. And Penny, the other question in there, and I think we may ask Roland as well um, as, as the questions go. Um, it's from Christine who's saying how much she's touched by your intimate process. Uh, and that you said you were working slowly. It, this is a question to talk a little bit more about your working process, please. God, I work so slowly, it's terrifying. 
Um, but I always, so um, I kind of, I, I, so I always use pencil or on paper. And for a, a long period of time at the start of the drawing, I'm just sort of wrestling to actually cover the paper. You can see in the drawing behind me. Um, well, I, I would say that I rub out almost as much as I put down marks. So, um, you know, when to talk about process, I can be really boring about pencil. But, I, um, you know, I use a soft graphite pencil. I'm constantly putting down a layer of uh, graphite and then rubbing it. And then once I start to make shape of the um, images, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of rubbing out and then redoing. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Some sort of, um, some to do with the fact that um, I want to spend time with whatever the subject is. And sometimes I need quite a lot of time with the subject. I, I would say that my big drawings probably take six months, although the one I'm working on at the moment seems to be taking longer than that. And so sometimes that the erasing is not letting go. But also that when you work like that, you get a kind of depth in the paper that's almost like, well, it's almost like you've got a series of hundred drawings. Um, so there's a, there's a real sort of talent, talent test thing happens. Um, I don't know, lockdown's been weird because think drawing's quite introverted. And during the pandemic, certainly I was drifting off into um, in a way which was far more um, spacey than I even normally am. Uh, I just felt very, very lost um, in the drawings in a, in, a, in a great way, in an amazing way. Um, but the other thing I think um, is that what I like to think about is the idea of um, punching, th I'm sort of feeling like even the, the picture itself is a kind of parallel dimension. So I, I feel like I'm, pushing through to something, an image that's on the other side of the paper, that is, um, so the paper is almost like a window into that world that I, you know, that I'm thinking about, that I'm conjuring. I mean, I think that whole sense of thinking through making and that time to distill um, and understand the subjects that you're working with, I think is absolutely deep seated in, in the way that the images are realized. I'm also interested in the kind of paper surfaces that you use, because actually you are working on solid paper, aren't you? But I kind of always had the thought that maybe you worked on layers um, of paper no, somewhere back in history. It's um, Well, I did used to work like that before I worked out how to draw actually, Anita, so that's very clever of you. That the um, I work on, um, it, it's Fabriano watercolour paper. So when I say I'm sort of tr trying to get through the surface, I actually am breaking down the paper um, in, a, in a quite a material way. I mean, and, and the thing about time is, I mean, the thing about time is always there. And it's maybe like, uh, it's often jumped into my head that I want to make pictures that are like novels, that have that, that much story in them. Um, but it's, I mean, it's interesting and it's, it's sort of related to Roland. It's, there's always those questions about representation with drawing, aren't there? What, what are you trying to represent? And how are you? What's the language of that? And, you know, for me, and also I think this relates more broadly to drawing, there's just something fantastic about the fact that it's just pencils and paper, but you know, you conjure up worlds. And isn't that amazing in an era where we're trying to be a bit light on our feet in terms of what we use and the environment? I think it's astonishing. I mean, I'm endlessly, as you would imagine, um, fascinated by what we can do with something so simple and modest. Um, but the depth and uh, the compression of information uh, that's all there to be teased out. Uh, if you can read drawing, uh, is I'm using the word read because I don't have a better word. Um, is really fascinating, um, and I think within your work, there's a kind of real density um, in terms of the layering of meaning and the references 
Um, so it's not just a novel. Well, it's a novel that relates out to the visual language, it relates out to history, it relates out to mythology, and it relates to a really specific contemporary place uh, and a contemporary phenomena. So there, there's an awful lot going on in there. Um, and it's a really rather beautiful analogy, as some has already also said in the chat, to talk about it as though it's a novel. I'm going to ask one more question which is in the chat because we're we we said this session would go on for a little bit longer than an hour anyway because we wanted to hear in a more in-depth way about your projects and practice um but the other question in the chat is um is for roland which is could you say a little bit more about how you arrive at the compositions and what guides you in making juxtapositions of different materials Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, sometimes I'm referencing another artist's work, um, so it might be a, um, a connection to the history of um, usually um, abstract painting. Um, and I think there's something um, slightly um, the thought of trying to do that in what appears to be chipboard, um, it, it, you know, um, like some, you know, like trying to reference Mondrian, but in the meat, in via oriented strand board or something. There, there's a, uh, I don't know, almost like a kind of folly about that, I think. Um, um, or it's sort of aspirational that the very mundane material is, is, is wanting to join the canon of art history in some way. Um, so I, th I think there's a sort of playful quality to that sometimes, but I do also then just get wrapped up in trying to make a satisfying abstract composition, which is not my, um, hasn't been my familiar territory as an artist, because for a long time uh, I made paintings that were more purely representational and um, so the language of abstraction is a bit of a playground for me, I think, uh, since I've been making work like this. And um, so I'm quite often just trying things out um, because I haven't done them in chipboard before. Um, and just see, seeing how versatile it can, it can be is a, you know, what potential it can have to take on other art forms. So, I mean, it could go somewhere completely different. It's, it's not to do with that particular area of art history, but, um, or I might just stop using chipboard. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I hope, hope that answers the question, but I mean, specifically, it, it can be quite intuitive, the, uh, the composition. Um, I think that does answer the question. I think it's um, I think what's really interesting is that with both of you actually about is the way that they both all the works transcend the materials that they're made in and of and about, um, and somehow there's a wonderful synthesis uh, and equivalent uh, within each. They're both all very precise. Every drawing is very precise, or every work uh, that you've presented today, and it's a really astonishing. Uh, two sets of work which are very very different um, but ha both have a kind of really unique sense of precision um, which is found through making uh, the proposal of making and thinking through materials is really important to them but they've got so many layers of meaning and references that they're incredibly rich um, we're now at um, 10 past, almost 10 past five so unless there are more questions um, to come in, which at the moment we've, we've answered the questions in the chat. There are lots of very positive comments about what a, an inspiring uh, combination of presentations, both individually and actually in their connected ways together. Um, so I think it's really um, been wonderful to hear both of you. And I think we've been really privileged to think about the way that you've approached this award, the way that you've facilitated a project which has been supported by the Evelyn Williams Trust um, and also the other aspects that come with that. So I'm really looking forward to working with both of you to realise 
the exhibitions. It's been a long run for Penny and I'm really looking forward to a studio visit in February. Um, and Roland really looking forward to, to visiting Hastings um, and to getting the conversation underway. It's been an enormous privilege to, to have this award in association uh, with the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize and formerly Jerwood Drawing Prize exhibitions. And it's a wonderful commitment uh, from the trustees to seeing this happen as it is from Hastings Contemporary. And Liz Gilmore has been a passionate supporter of this project uh, from the beginning. So it's a project of many parts, which is very much about allowing a deepening um, of work, a, a project proposal to be realised uh, and a body of work to come from that. So thank you both of you for very generous introductions to the work and I'm, hopefully we'll see more of you uh, through these drawing discussions with some individual conversations and presentations as we get uh, both closer to the exhibitions for both of you. So thank you so much and congratulations on everything that you've achieved so far. That for me draws us to a close in terms of uh, thanking everybody for joining us this afternoon, thanking you for being our fabulous participants, thanking Fiona in the background for rescuing the technology, um, and also a big thank you to Arts Council England who've supported the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize exhibition to come to Drawing Projects UK in Wiltshire and the engagement programme that goes alongside it. So as a reminder for those of you who can visit, the exhibition is on and from the 8th, well, it started on the 8th of January, it runs to the 5th of March, open Tuesday to Friday. And in terms of the ongoing events, they run on Tuesday evenings, most Saturdays, and there are some drawing sessions added in, some in person, mostly online, so that we can undertake group activity as we roll through the continuing public health measures and we can engage with people across the world in those sessions. So an enormous thank you to everybody this afternoon. Uh, the next drawing discussion is on Tuesday with Victoria Claiborne and Fiona Mishi. Um, we're really looking forward to that too. But what a wonderful afternoon with Penny and Roland. And please forgive drawing projects for our technological glitches. They always happen just when you need them. Uh, but can I say one enormous thank you. It's been a great pleasure to have everybody with us this afternoon and a real pleasure, Roland and Penny, to hear from you. Thank you.